Good morning, everybody. We will get started here in just one minute or just a few seconds. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. We are back for breakfast clubs. Yes, we are going to talk today all about hemming. Like I've told you before, I'm going to teach you how to do it and then you tell no one. <laughs> Good morning. How was everybody's evening? Did we get some rest? Ready to start the day? Um, don't forget that tonight we fall back an hour. So we're going to get It'll get a little bit easier to get up in the morning because it won't be quite as pitch black outside. Um, so yes, yeah, so don't forget to change your clocks. Don't want you to be super early to things. <laughs> yeah, I completely forgot to miss Dawn until um, uh, Somebody was talking about it on the radio this morning. I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that does happen today now, doesn't it? See if I can get into the swing of things or back into the swing of things here at Breakfast Club. It's been, a, it's been about a month. Um, so, and I haven't really taught either because I didn't teach in October. So I haven't been in the studio. So we're going to see if I remember all the buttons to push. All right, so we're going to get started with our um, lesson for today. And we're gonna talk about, I know it, this is a, a short girl problem more than it is a tall girl problem, um, is hemming. We are going to kind of cover a few different techniques. I'm going to demonstrate the sewing machine techniques. I didn't bring an overlocker back here today, um, but I will um, talk about how to do a uh, roll hem and a cover stitch on the overlocker as well. So we'll kind of review that. We have talked about them previously, but those are whole lessons in themselves that we will go over today. Let me get one thing. Where is the camera that I want? There it is. So the most important thing to hemming is one, you've got to figure out how much you need to cut off. Okay. And once you figure that out, you need to also make sure that you leave any sort of necessary seam allowance that we're going to need, um, things along that lines. You need to press your hem. Do not try to do your hemming just by eyeballing it, okay? Because I'll guarantee you that one side will end up longer or shorter than the other. So we want to um, make sure that we get our hem in place in the appropriate location. So I like to use this technique of, hem, of uh, pressing my hem. I don't, I'm not a big user of, um, let me grab it. We're all very familiar with this tool, right? <laughs> um, so this is fine if you're working around, you know, something in a tube, but it can, you may not be 100% accurate. So when I'm hemming, I like to use a piece of cardstock, uh, an old manila folder, anything along that ways. I will mark on the f cardstock or folder the um, depth of my hem. So I have a two inch line marked here because what I can do is if I take my item that I'm gonna hem and we fold this, put it in here, and then you can fold up to the line. And then you know from that edge to this line is two inches. And then you don't have to break out rulers and things like that. 
doesn't have to be a super long piece. It could be a short piece, especially if you're using um, hemming something in the round that's small. It can just be a little piece. They make um, hem rulers, all sorts of things like that that you can use and so on and so forth. But this will be just fine if you're not into hemming and you just need to do something real fast, okay? So what I've done on this side is I folded that over. I do have a two inch hem, okay? I have also finished the edge of my fabric. The first thing I'm gonna show you is a uh, blind hem. And a blind hem does have a raw edge to it. And so if you were doing this on a pair of pants, you would want to cut off the excess and I would zigzag around the raw edge or run it through the overlocker with like a three thread overlock, um, just so that um, on the inside of the pants, it doesn't continue to ravel on you and it, you get a really nice um, finish there. Okay. So once we have it in um, hemmed or pressed, I haven't hemmed yet, Amy, um, we're going to look at the sewing machine. We're gonna use the free arm, okay? And the free arm is going to be your best friend when you are sewing things that are in the round, okay? So sewing things in the round on a Bernina, we have two options of a free arm, okay? We have the, the small free arm that if you take your tray tables off that are perfect for small items, okay? Like um, baby garments, sleeves, pant legs, things along that lines. You can also use your slide on tray tables. Now you'll notice that on our slide on tray tables, we don't have any additional legs or things to them. And that's so we can slide larger items over the free arm using the tray table to give us a larger opening, okay, or a larger surface to lay or allow our um, large item to um, kind of lay on. That also, if you're using the tray table, it gives you additional printed measurements. Some of you may have the adjustable guide that snaps onto that tray table to help you be consistent. Okay, so that is um, going to be really helpful so that you don't have to keep stopping and adjusting every few stitches or taking the chance of accidentally sewing the underside of your item to what you're currently sewing. And so use your free arm and it will be your best friend. So again, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about a blind hem. Okay. So with the blind hem, it's a traditional hem that you see a lot of in uh, pa dress pants, skirts, jackets, even draperies um, that are there. You want to, if you need to hem something smaller than an inch, then a blind hem probably isn't gonna be your best choice. It really works best with hem depths of over an inch and a quarter. It does produce almost an invisible hem and a very clean um, inside. Okay. With the invisible hem, we are going to use foot number five and we're gonna use the blind hem stitch. Okay, that's on the machine. And so if I come over here, we're gonna pretend like this is the front of this, your sewing machine, I'm gonna come in here I am going to tell the machine I'm going to use foot number five. And the blind hem stitch is on an 880 is a um, stitch number nine. It kind of looks like a straight and then there's a zigzag. It could be anywhere, depending upon the machine, it could be stitch seven, it could be eight. If you're unsure, remember, on the machines with the touch screens, you have the ability to touch the question mark and then select the stitch. And that will define or tell you what the stitch is. So if you're not sure, like, well, that kind of looks, number three kind of looks like a blind hem, 
but number three is actually an overlock stitch. It's going the wrong direction to be a blind hem. So stitch number nine, you'll see that um, on the screen, everything is kind of set up with the default settings, which is what we're going to use it at, okay? And I'll talk about um, the different ways that we could change it. But I am gonna do one other thing first before we blind hem is I am going to machine based. Let me get the camera changed here. I'm gonna baste my hem in place. Let me get this machine set up for a basting stitch. Blind hemming is not as hard as you think it is. Um, I do believe that if you baste the hem in place first, it does make hemming much easier. It makes folding a blind hem much easier. Okay, so I'm just gonna put my foot down here. I am going to follow the edge of my stitching here. I'm just gonna do a big basting stitch. This will get taken out after my hem is done, but this allows us to know where to fold. So my hem is now basted. It also means that I don't need to worry about pins when I'm basting, when I'm doing a blind hem. I don't need to do anything, okay? It's gonna hold it in place. I don't have to stress. We've pressed it so we have a nice crease. We've now basted it in place. I'm gonna switch back over to my blind hem foot and stitch number nine on this machine. So. Folding a blind hem can be the most, uh, I don't want to say difficult, but can be the most confusing. So what you're going to do is it's easiest if you take this little seam allowance that you, oops, let's not raise that foot up. Um, if you take this seam allowance that you just created, and you kind of pick that up by the seam allowance and fold under your hem, you'll get this look here. You'll have your garment and you'll have the seam allowance of the, um, the hem you just created kind of sticking out to the right. Okay. What we're gonna do is there is a blade that runs down the middle of the number five foot, okay? The blade down the middle of that foot really isn't in the middle of that foot, so don't think, ooh, I could use this for stitching in the ditch because it's really not um, there. It's going to be what you use to guide the fold up against, okay? So I'm gonna Put this underneath. I'm gonna make sure my fold is pulled all the way back. And I'm gonna start stitching. And what's gonna happen is the straight stitch of the blind hem is gonna end up in the seam allowance, okay? It's gonna end up where this is not gonna be seen. And then after a few stitches, it's going to jump over for one zigzag and then come back to straight and then zigzag, straight, zigzag, straight. Now. The goal is, is that zigzag, that jump that happens there is going to be just big enough to pinch that fold. The farther it jumps into this fabric, the more you will see that stitch from the front side of your garment, okay? The stitch width on the blind hem is set up for like a default of like 3.5 you can make adjustments to the width of that based upon the fabric or the garment that you are hemming. You know, hemming a thin piece of cotton is gonna be very different than if you're trying to hem a wool skirt. So you may, because this fold would be thicker in a wool, like a wool skirt, 
you may need the width of your blind hem to be larger in order for it to jump over and catch the fold. If it doesn't catch the fold, then you're not really going to end up hemming. Your, your, your hem's going to fall out because nothing is holding on to this fold. Okay? So. I'm going to stitch here, and then I will show you. So I'm just sewing. I'm keeping the, the guide of the foot right up against the fold that I created. Okay. <clears throat> Should have probably done this in a really bright colored thread. Okay. So... I think you can see it. So there's the straight stitches, and then there's the one little zigzag that kind of jumps over and just pinches the edge of that fold. Let's get my hand around here. You can see how it just grabs the edge of that fold. Okay, so that little zigzag is what is actually holding up the hem out here and you see you may not be able to see it but that little tiny pinch of thread is what is actually holding up the hem I can take a seam ripper maybe <laughs> if I had one maybe not that's okay no I'm good I got it I got, a, I got a screwdriver that can pull out basting stitches. Pull out your basting stitch. There we go. And let me come back over to a different camera because that'll make more sense. Okay, so now that my basting stitch is gone, Maybe you can see better there. There's the little tiny stitch of the zigzag. If that zigzag took any more of a bite into the fold, that would be larger. It'd be a little more visible. Now, typically when I'm blind hemming, this would be done in thread that matched my item. So even if it was a little bit bigger, here's the back side. It's in blue thread there. Um, but that's the only thing that's holding that up is that little tiny pinch of the zigzag. Okay. That is a blind hem. See, not, it didn't even break a sweat. Okay. So there, now granted this is a, a rectangle piece of fabric, but um, there's your blind hem. Give it another good press and that seam will stay where it belongs. And you've just hemmed. Now, if you were hemming something in the round, <clears throat> let me get this back over here so you can make sure you can hear me. If you were hemming something in the round, you would start in one location, travel all the way around, go slightly past where you started, and then I would do a locking stitch. And so I would switch over to my straight stitch and stitch a couple of very small stitches um, in a row, do a couple of packing stitches so that you can just secure it to make sure that it is cooperating where it needs to be. Okay, does that make sense? Questions? Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Now again, up on our website at uh, the YouTube tab here, let me pull it up for you. Um, I'll put the link in the thing. You can download the presentation. I'm doing it right now for you. Um, you can download the presentation PDF. And that will have all of these steps in it as well. And I link some videos at the end too. Okay. 
Okay. Let's talk about, so there's a, a little close up of what's happening, a little graphic image on how to fold. Let's talk about a narrow hem. Narrow hemming usually would be like a double fold hem. They would tell you to fold up a half inch twice um, or, you know, one inch twice. Uh, narrow hems are usually like quarter inches twice or even smaller than that. Usually a technique that you see on the edges of scarves, napkins, blouses, ruffles, not personally not really a technique that I would use on uh, regular cotton fabric, okay? But definitely um, for your lightweight, really lightweight uh, garment fabrics, things along that lines, this will help. There is a presser foot that we're gonna use. It does take patience and practice, okay? With that particular foot, and there are five different possible hemmer feet that are available, and we have two roll hem shell hemmer feet available as well that are there. Depending upon the foot is gonna determine what size the hem is that is happening, and it's going to dictate if you can do a straight stitch or a zigzag with it which is why you see there are two two millimeter hammer feet and then the other ones say zigzag or straight depending upon the stitch that you're going to use, okay? So I am going to um, show you how to load this foot and how to stitch with this foot. We're gonna see if I can hold my head, my hands, and my tongue in the right location to make all of this happen. Um, this is definitely not my favorite way of hemming. I try, in all honesty, I try to avoid hemming with this foot. It's fine if you were doing a straight edge. I don't like turning corners with it. Okay, because um, you have to stitch completely off and then rotate. So if you were doing a napkin, you would do completely do one side, rotate. You'd have to start your hemming with this foot down from the corner, and then you have to manually do the corner. Okay, there's no way to miter or rotate or anything like that. Freehand system is going to be your best friend. Okay, starch the edge of your fabric. Just to give it more body, it's gonna help you uh, be able to feed things uh, into the presser foot if you've, the um, fabric will you know, work with you. Um, again, talking about doing corners. Lighter fabric is better than any of your mid to heavy fabrics. I would not do this technique with flannel. Um, pack, uh, practice, patience, perseverance, and just in a good old in general, just don't do it. <laughs> If you really want to save yourself gray hair and um, wanting to throw some things out, avoid it. Now, there are people, um, a lot of us use this um, particular technique and presser feet in a lot of bridal wear. Uh, you will find it on like hemming, shears, overlays, things along that lines. This is what the foot looks like, okay? So the foot has a coil in there that you guide the fabric into the coil and it's gonna fold it and fold it again so that you can get back to the machine to stitch it in place. So let's see if I can make it happen today. Now the biggest trick to the foot is getting the fabric into the foot. Okay, now what I have here is I have stiffened this fabric, okay? It feels like paper. I'm going to put this underneath of the foot. I am going to follow the edge of the foot and I'm gonna pull my bobbin thread up to the top and I want to get a hold of both my upper and lower thread. Okay. 
because we're going to use these tails to load the foot. Okay, I'm going to stitch two or three inches. Okay, I'm going to raise my foot and raise my needle. I am not going to cut my thread because I'm going to grab that thread too. Okay. We're going to use the tails to load, to help pull the fabric into the foot. Okay, so I'm gonna use the tails. This is where your freehand system comes in handy because I don't want the foot all the way up at the highest it could be. Do, 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 do. going to cooperate for me. <laughs> Give me one second. They always make this look so much easier in the videos, but that's what I said. Patience, patience, patience. Okay. So what I'm going to do typically it takes a few stitches at the beginning to get it started. I'm going to kind of hold my finger with the fabric folded over. Okay. And that's just going to help guide things into the foot. Obviously, we would be using the same thread top and bottom. I'm not going to make you watch me do it all the way, but there's your narrow hem. Okay, let me change cameras so that you can see. Okay, I have turquoise thread in the bobbin. <laughs> but it folds it over and stitches it in place. You can move the needle position to be closer or farther away from the edge. But like I said, it's not, and even this fabric, this is just muslin. On that size hemmer that I had there, this is even a little bit too thick for that. Okay, that's narrow hemming. Next up is hemming a knit. And when we hem a knit on a sewing machine, um, we typically use a double needle. Okay. So double needle stitching is going to give you the overall same look that you would get if you were using a cover stitch machine. It's also going to give you a hem that will stretch with stretchier fabrics and not pop. So you won't um, break a stitch or anything along that lines. So the um, thing that we're going to do is first, we need to set the machine up to use a double needle. And we're going to talk about security programs. Ms. Karen asked, why would I want to zigzag hem in uh, with the hemmer feet? Sometimes depending upon the fabric that you are using, you may want a zigzag. Obviously, like if it was a, an undercoat, like a petticoat or something like that, or even shears, most people use a straight stitch, but the option is there with a zigzag. And plus, with the ability to do a zigzag with it, um, you may find that um, it also gives you the ability to do a little more needle position movement with that um, stitch as well. 
Okay. So hemming a knit with a double needle, you could do it with a single needle, but again, what's gonna happen is when you go to stretch that sweatshirt or stretch that t-shirt to put it on, you could very well pop that seam, you could break the thread with the stretch because a straight stitch doesn't really stretch um, on uh, knits. So we're going to look at putting in a double needle. I'm gonna talk about how to thread a double needle. We're gonna talk about the security program for the machines as well, and double needles, okay? So first, a double needle is literally a, or actually, let's, um, single shank, so it goes in your machine, um, just like a regular standal needle, needle would, and coming off of that is two needles. Double needles come in a variety of sizes and a variety of um, types. Like there's a ballpoint double needle, there's a universal double needle, you've got a metallic double needle, I believe. The size of the double needle, there are two sizes related, two numbers related. One is going to be like 2.0, 3.0, 5.0. And then you'll have the other that gives you um, 80s, 90s, things along that lines. The two, two and a half, and three relate to the distance between the two needles. Okay? So a 3.0 double needle is telling you that there are three millimeters between needle one and needle two. Okay? And two and a half, and so on and so forth. Now, you are limited to the size double needle that you can do, use based on the stitch width of your machine, okay? So if you have a machine that can only do up, can do a five and a half millimeter stitch width, you can't use a double needle over four millimeters. And if you have a nine millimeter stitch width machine, you can use all of them, okay? Typically we use them for straight stitch, but you can use double needles with decorative stitches. But again, depending upon the size of your needle, the capacity of your machine for a stitch width is going to dictate how wide that stitch can be, okay? I'm gonna give you some math in a minute but on the, the current machines, our current line machines, and these go all the way back to our 200s, the 185s, the 165s, 630s, 640s, we all have a security program, okay? So in the older machines, it was the white triangle with the red exclamation point. In today's machines, we have this icon um, on the machine that has a picture of a stitch plate. You also have the icon with the picture of a needle. If we touch the needle, it opens up this security program. And at the top, you've got all sorts of needle choices. And at the bottom, you have choices of stitch plates. These are dictating what size double needle you are using. So if I'm gonna put a 3.0 double needle into my machine, I'm gonna choose 3.0, I will close that. And you will see that if I go to a zigzag, okay, it's gonna stitch me two zigzags, but I will reach a point with that zigzag that the machine will not increase past what that needle is capable of. So I can't go to my full nine millimeter stitch width, okay? Remember, you've got a needle that is now three millimeters wide, so that's gonna take up some of your stitch width. If you have a legacy machine, so my Auroras, my 153s, my 1130s, my 930s, things like that, you have to do a little math in order to determine what is the maximum width of a stitch that you can use with a double needle, okay? 
Simple math, don't need a calculator for it. You take the maximum stitch width of your machine, which is going to probably be 5.5 millimeters for most of those machines. You are going to subtract the size of your double needle. Okay, so five and a half minus this three millimeter double needle that I'm gonna use leaves me with two and a half. Which means if I am going to do a decorative stitch with this double needle, okay, so let me clear this out because we can. I can't do a decorative stitch that is wider than two and a half. Okay, so not all the time are they gonna look pretty that small, so I would definitely test it first. But if I was doing a zigzag, my zigzag couldn't be any wider than 2.5, okay? Um, if you go wider than that, then it is probably going to break your double needle, okay? So I'm gonna choose a straight stitch. What's gonna happen with using a double needle is you get two rows of straight stitching on top of the machine, on top of your fabric, and on the underside of your fabric, you're going to get a zigzag. Okay, because we're gonna thread the machine twice and then we are going to only be using one bobbin, okay? Now, threading the machine twice, you have two spool pins, right? We got one that stands up, one that lays down, or if you're using a multi-spool holder, they both stand up. They are going to follow the same exact thread path with one exception. Okay, and I will um, find that a, a graphic here for us to use in one second. Um, on an eight series machine, I want to specifically talk about an eight series machine first because threading a double needle on an eight series machine, we have to deactivate the needle threading, right? Because that swinging of the needle threader on an eight series machine is only designed to be used with one needle. And when you add a second needle, um, we need to deactivate it because otherwise it's going to swing into our, um, into our needles, crash into it, and it's not gonna thread, okay? So when you go to thread a double needle on a um, eight series, when you take your first thread up through the top of the machine, the little um, top thing, this screen comes up. This is what activates the threader, right? Everybody's familiar with that screen. Do you see this icon right down here in this bottom corner? That icon is telling, is what you're going to use to tell the machine not to thread the needle, okay? So we would touch that. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna activate it when we push the needle threading button on the front of the machine, it is going to work through the process of threading the inside of the machine, but the needle threader itself is not going to swing to the needle. You will need to manually thread both needles, okay, on those eight series machines. So that's, that applies to an 820, an 830, an 880, all of those machines. Okay. All right, let me, I think I've got a graphic that we can use here for threading all other machines with a double needle. Okay, just give me one second. Um, so like I said, everything else is gonna follow the same path 
for threading, okay? Except you're gonna come here, they're both going to go underneath that back clip. When you come forward, right here, let me zoom in, right here, you can kind of see it sticking up right there. There is a tension disc. I'm going to take one thread to the right of that disc, and I am going to take the other thread to the left of that disc. Now, it's not, if you forget that and you thread them both in the same side, it's not the end of the world. Your machine is not gonna yell at you. Um, but if you are having issues with maybe tension with one side of your stitch, things along that lines, it's possible because they're both sitting on the same side of the tension disc and one is getting a little bit more tension than the other, okay? And then you just follow the same, the same path down around up and then down here to the guides and then through the needles. Again, you will have to manually thread those needles, okay? Because needle threaders on the machines were only designed to be done with a single needle. And then you're just going to stitch, okay, the, the stitch, and it will stitch those two straight stitches on top and have the, two, the one zigzag that's happening on the bottom, okay? So that's a double needle. You do have in all of your owner's manuals, if you know where they're at and have opened them, there is information in your owner's manuals on double needle threading. I do believe I cover it in Bernina Mastery, which is up on YouTube as well uh, for the machine and things along that lines. Now, what we're doing, what we just did with a double needle on a sewing machine is what cover stitching does on an overlocker, okay? So cover stitching on an overlocker is going to generate us two lines of stitching on the front and on the underside, we're gonna have this interlocking woven looper threads, okay? That zigzag on the sewing version and this stitch here, the looper on the cover stitch version is what allows this stitch to stretch without breaking your thread, without popping your threads, okay? So that's what gives the straight stitch a little bit of elasticity for that. Okay, and so basically we use a two needle cover stitch. You could use a three needle if you want. Um, it's up to you and you can, with cover stitching, we've got wide cover stitches, we have narrow cover stitches. It just depends upon your, pro your, your project, the weight of your fabric, things along that lines. Using a hem guide on the machine uh, just for the depth and then run it through the machine, okay? On a cover stitch, remember we don't, uh, we come around the tubular item, come a little bit past where you started, and then you can pull your needle threads and pull them to the back to um, lock your stitch, okay? Now with an overlocker, we can also do a banded hem, which is kind of a faux hem, where we would just build in extra fabric and then fold it up and then cover stitch it, or not cover stitch it, overlock it, to give this look of sewing on an extra band at the bottom of the shirt. You could also do this with um, a complementary color of fabric, a contrast fabric. Uh, think of like the band at the bottom of a sweatshirt, um, but we do it with, uh, we call it a mock band. Uh, we're not actually going to put that, that additional piece of fabric on there, but we want the shirt or the item to look like we put a cuff or band on it. So there are techniques in how to do that as well. Now, like I've said up on the PDF that I linked in the comments or up on our website, you have... Um, all of, you can download this PDF that I have exactly all the, the slides you just saw are in the PDF. These are also links in the PDF. 
that you can um, click. So this is going to take you to a um, ebook on machine hemming uh, with Bernina. There's a video on how to do a blind hem with number five. There's a We All Sew article on it. So if watching the video doesn't make much sense to you, you can read about it. We have videos on how to use those hemmer feet. And then again, a blog post from We All Sew about those feet. So, because a lot of the videos that Bernina does, you know, they don't really have words. It's just people moving and music um, and sometimes a little fast. So the blog posts are going to give you um, the verbiage and a little slower pace so that you can read more about it. And then there's another video and a blog post on hemming three different ways, blind hem, folded hem, and um, I can't think of the other one, but there's a third one there as well for you. All right. So now the most important part, like I have always said to you in this, is now that I have taught you how to do it, you tell no one that you know how to do it. Because like I've told you in the past, you will be everybody's new best friend they will all want you to hem their pants and skirts and sleeves and things along that lines. And it's really not that much fun to do that. I don't even do it for myself, let alone want to do it for somebody else. So, um, <clears throat> Why won't you have mine? yep, I don't, I don't even do it for dad. My machines, my machines don't do it. I'm sorry, my machine doesn't do that. Um, Miss Lori asks on the new serger, is it easier to switch between overlock and cover stitch? Um, not, I mean, yes and no. It's still the same steps. You still have to take off the cover plate for the knives. You have to disengage the upper looper and things along that lines. The steps are the same, at least on the Bernina's. Um, to switch between an overlock and a cover stitch, um, that's there. It's it's not any different um, in terms of the steps. You still have to do them. To me, um, it's easier to thread than anything. But the steps are still there. You still have to um, take off that plate change your foot, move your needles from one position to the other, disengage the upper looper, disengage the knives. Um, so, no. Yes, easier, but the steps are still there. It's not the click of one button and the machine jumps from one, one to the other. Um, it is a little more intuitive. There are steps on the, eight, the L860 and the L890. They have a guided mode. And that guided mode literally walks you through, okay, you're going to do this, and here's a video on how to do it. And then when you're done that step, you hit the check, and then it goes to the next step. Okay, we're going to do this. So, yes, it is intuitive. It is, you know, a little bit easier with the guided mode. You don't have to find your manual. You don't have to pull all that stuff out. But there is it's still the same number of steps that have to be done. But yeah, you don't have to look at, look for the book every time. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for joining me here this morning at Breakfast Club. Um, the next club will be the 20th. Next Breakfast Club will be the 20th. We are going to focus on machine embroidery. We are going, I'm going to give you a little overview of the Kimberbell's clear blue tiles on the 20th. So for those that have machine embroidery and are interested or curious about quilting things in their embroidery hoops using machine quilting designs for a computerized quilting look, I'm going to give you a general overview um, on the 20th at Breakfast Club. A little, this is what it is and kind of this is how it works. I do have two classes um, in November before that uh, breakfast club. The in-person clear blue tiles class is currently full. I will do it again. 
um, next time. The virtual class has, still has openings available. So the um, Clear Blue Tiles virtual, which you would be just fine to be able to take provided you um, know how to use your embroidery machine. Um, or I can walk you through it uh, virtually. But there is that class is available as well. And then I will do them again in person as well for those um, that want a little more hands-on, especially after I introduce it to you here at Breakfast Club. Um, let's see. Miss Indy asks, what type of hem would I use if I'm finishing the edge of a man's button-down shirt? It's been cut and using the fabric as an apron. Um, I would use a double folded hem, okay? So let me show you, but I wouldn't use a narrow hem because, you know, I don't like using those feet. <laughs> They're not my favorite feet in the world. So if I was going to, let me, let me get my fabric here. Let's change cameras real fast. Okay. So if I was going to hem the bottom of a shirt, um, or anything along that lines. And I wanted to do maybe do a half inch hem and I want to do it twice so that I um, completely encase my raw edge. Now, if you have an overlocker, if you finish the edge of this, then you could just turn it up once if you wanted. But turning up a hem twice, you know, typically most of you would probably go, okay, I'm going to turn up a half inch I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna press all of that. I'm probably gonna burn my fingers a few times and then I'm gonna turn it again. If you take whatever your hem is going to be, so if it's a half inch hem twice, I'm gonna take my fabric, I'm going to measure up one inch. Okay, so I'm gonna double that. I am going to fold to that line, okay? And then you can fold in half. Again, you don't have to get out measuring tools, things along that lines. You could also fold up if I went up two inches. So if I quadrupled it, I could fold up to this line, press, and then I could fold that in half. And then, so if I folded to the two inch line, then I can open that up and I can fold my raw edge into that fold and that would give me the same half inch hem. And then I would just use my number 10 foot, my edge stitch foot, or you could just use your number one and move your needle position and stitch as close to that folded edge as possible. That's how I would hem the bottom of a shirt, personally. The um, the narrow folded hem is you're not you're not going to be happy with it especially when you get to like the side seams where you know double folding over is at some points you know could be six or eight layers of fabric um so this is definitely going to be easier to manually fold and top stitch especially when you get to areas where there are bulkier seams that's there so i hope that helps <laughs> But yeah, I try to do everything I can to avoid having to pull this little ruler out and constantly move it across. I always feel like things are never completely straight. Because um, how many of how many of these do you have that are bent that are not straight anymore? So you know, the moment that things get bent, they're really not 100% accurate. Just like your mats, the moment they get warped, those measurements are no longer consistent. So um, I don't do a lot of things that need to be super accurate with this. I will measure those measurements and fold up. I will use my manila folder um, as well so that it's just got a permanent, consistent, accurate fold line for me versus having to deal with this. So, All right, everybody. Well, I hope you have a great weekend. Stay warm and don't forget it's daylight saving time um, tonight. So, or two o'clock in the morning tomorrow. So don't forget to fall back an hour if you live in an area that observes it. Um, otherwise, I hope you have a great weekend and we will see you here again for Breakfast Club on November 20th. Bye everybody.